Hi, everyone, and welcome to EAGX Virtual 2020 Lightning Talks. We're about to watch 12 videos submitted by attendees just like you on topics ranging from biosecurity to cultivated meat to donation pledges to imposter syndrome. Some of our speakers represent EA organizations. Others are individuals presenting their own thoughts and experiences or research they've done in their spare time. Their work demonstrates the depth, scope, thoughtfulness, and commitment to action that the EA community brings to the challenge of doing good better. We're proud to share these talks with you today. Presenting EAGX Virtual 2020 Lightning Talks. Hey, my name is Cecilia Tilley, and uh, I am the Secretary General of the Foundation to Prevent Antibiotic Resistance. And I will speak briefly about antimicrobial resistance and how this could be a cause that joins global health and development with long-termism and biosecurity. So quick background, antibiotic resistance. This is what happens when we use antibiotics against bacterial infections and the bacteria evolve so that the treatment becomes ineffective. And this is estimated today to cause about 700,000 deaths yearly and it's expected to cause about 10 million deaths yearly by 2050. So if we have a quick look here at what are the drivers of antibiotic resistance. So the problem we have is that we have infections on humans that are resistant to some antibiotic. And perhaps the most well-known driver of this is antibiotic treatment of viral infections. So this is considered misuse of antibiotics because antibiotics do not work against viruses. So you get all of the side effects, but you get none of the benefits of the treatment. And also it drives antibiotic resistance. And this happens uh, because prescribers are not following guidelines. And it can also happen because of a lack of diagnostics. And a bunch of other drivers, such as antibiotics sold without prescription or the patient expectation and some other that are linked to poverty. A different driver would be therapeutic justified antibiotic treatment because correct treatment also drives resistance. And the drivers of this use is both the lack of alternatives and also uh, the amount of infections themselves. And the drivers for infections in turn would be factors such as urbanization, travel, hand hygiene, weak immune systems, but also factors such as suboptimal policies and resource allocation, and also lacking health education, which again can link to poverty. And then we have a group of drivers that are uh, related to agricultural use of antibiotics, and another group that are related to transmission of the resistant infections in healthcare. And if we look at the whole uh, mapping of drivers that I have done, it looks like this. So this is obviously a very complex image. And um, what we have to do if we want to prevent antibiotic resistance in an effective way is to really analyze the situation and understand what are the most strategic drivers to target. And in the past 10, 20 years, uh, the interest in this area has grown, the awareness has grown, and also a lot more resources are allocated to antibiotic resistance. Uh, but my impression is that quite a lot of these resources are still not allocated in the best way. For example, resources would be spent on uh, uh, information campaigns that lack a solid evidence base and a lot of uh, Interventions are done also without a proper measurement of uh, the effect and follow-up to know if this is useful to scale to other places. So I think this is an opportunity for EAs that we can uh, have a potential to improve the allocation of resources that are already dedicated to this area. I also think that this area is uh, interesting to EAs as a very down-to-earth way of introducing long-termism in a global health setting because antimicrobial resistance is something that people that work with global health are familiar with, and there are very clear consequences today uh, that can be seen, especially in poor countries. But you also have this link to um, what this means for what kind of healthcare we can expect to have in 100 years or in 200 years. 
So I think in that way, it's an interesting uh, uh, field where you don't have global health on the one side and long-termism on the other side, but where they really go together. I also think there is a clear overlap with biosecurity and biorisk, uh, both in terms of policy interventions and in terms of uh, preventing the spread of infectious disease. And I think this could be a promising field for career entry because there are positions on many levels in research, governance, and NGOs. And I think the experience and network you can build here is valuable for many different paths in research, policy, global health, and biorisk. Thank you. Hi, I'm Noga. I'm a master's student in systems biology in Israel, and I interned at the Center for Health Security two years ago. In this talk, I'll explain what paths can lead to an effective career in biosecurity. So there are three main disciplines that come together in biosecurity and are epidemiology, international relations, and biology. However, the sense I got is that the most needed people right now are policymakers with a PhD in biology. Let me explain why. So pandemic preparedness and prevention comfortably sits within epidemiology, and epidemiologists already kind of think like effective altruists, so entering this area as an effective altruist won't really give you a competitive advantage. However, people who completed recent PhDs and have expertise in emerging biotechnologies have an insight that's much more rare in the field, and is especially useful for issues that EA focuses on, like engineered pandemics. Policymaking is generally superior because the technical biosecurity work is almost always funded by governments or other nonprofits, so it's not constrained so much by skill. Some EAs asked me in the past about being academics in the field, for instance, in which you have social influence, that is for sure, but academics especially are funded by grant makers. So overall, if you you want to be a grant maker if you're entering the field, or you want to be a body that advises the grant maker, which is essentially what the Center for Health Security does. When I was at the Center for Health Security, I was also told many times that in order to be an expert in the field who is appreciated, you need to have a terminal degree. That's an MD, a JD, or a PhD. If you're not sure you can commit to such a long path, the bite side, is that internships are very common as a starting point. Um, do know, however, that biology professors are often wary of people with interests in biosecurity because they see them, sometimes correctly, as anti-science and anti-technology. So be careful about how you present yourself and your experiences if you're planning to pursue a PhD after an internship. If you're not committed to a biology PhD, but do want to enter the field, another common path is to start a fellowship, then get a low-level role in the same or other place, and advance in rank while getting any additional degrees concurrently at the same institution where you work. About the job itself, most of the jobs are in the US, and having an American citizenship really helps in that case, because many jobs also require a security clearance. Also, making connections is really important, not only because it's a small field, but because it is through connections and collaborations that productive projects are carried out. I can say that the list on the 80,000 hours job board is pretty good and representative. In addition, there are some projects done in the EA community by individuals, sometimes remotely, so that's another option. If you want to get involved, get in touch with me or Greg Lewis, who is kind of the gatekeeper to the community. And finally, I'd like to say that although many EAs are starting to direct their trajectory into this field, there's still a lot of work to be done and expertise to be had, especially during and after this current pandemic. Hello, and thank you for joining my talk today. My name is Jennifer, and I'm the research and project strategist at Fish Welfare Initiative. 50 years ago, the first major campaigns in the animal movement were launched. We started with the most relatable animals, such as primates and rabbits being experimented on. Later, we graduated to farmed animals, initially focusing on cows and pigs. Now, our movement's primary focus is chickens, 
largely because of the immense number of chickens farmed. This movement is about the expansion of our moral circle, and we're on the verge of the next frontier, fish. Now, since no good cause area pitch would be complete without it, I will quickly run you through the ITN framework for fish. First, scale. Roughly 111 billion fish are alive on farms at any given point. That's more than twice the number of chickens and over 100 times the number of pigs. And yes, there's general scientific consensus that fish can feel pain. Yet conditions on fish farms are often alarming. Fish are crowded in monotonous tanks with dubious water quality, suffer under diseases and parasites, and often they have no opportunity to express their natural behavior. They're generally treated like a commodity without any moral worth. We took this picture in Vietnam. It shows Pangasius catfish being transported to a slaughterhouse. Fish are stored like this in small buckets while fully conscious for 10 to 20 minutes. And all this is to say nothing of the trillions of wild fish killed annually. Despite these immense numbers, fish farming is still largely neglected. As we speak, only two EA-aligned organizations focus primarily on fish, the Aquatic Life Institute and us, Fish Welfare Initiative. So third, tractability. We hope our work can demonstrate the tractability of fish welfare work. Already now we have seen some preliminary successes from other organizations, for example, certification schemes, including welfare, and open cages successfully pushed for a ban of live fish sale in Eastern European countries. Our work comes in stages. First, we research the most promising ways of helping fish. Second, we want to prove that interventions can work with a micro-level pilot program. And third, we scale our impact up to the macro level by corporate and governmental outreach. For the next two minutes, I want to share some of our findings with you. First, fish species and farming systems are extremely diverse. Consider all the different species and farming systems the animal movement has worked with already, from pigs and gestation crates to chickens and battery cages. Fish are not just one more species. They represent about 370 different species currently farmed by humans, and each of these has very specific welfare needs. Farming systems are just as diverse. On the left side, you see an intensive agriculture system. Every parameter is controlled and monitored. On the right side, you see an extensive system. Fish are simply left in a pond with little attention given. Point two is about expertise. Fish Welfare Initiative was founded last year and our co-founders didn't have prior expertise in the field. Rather, like many of you, they were generalists with a strong drive to do good. So you don't need expertise to get off the ground. But it sure does help. We learned this lesson when we hired a PhD as our fish welfare specialist, and our research process is dramatically better now. Another crucial lesson is one that surely all of you can relate to. You can have a perfect, fully developed plan, but there are always elements you simply cannot predict. For example, a global pandemic. COVID-19 threw our plans overboard. The field farm visits we were doing are now virtually impossible. During this forest break, we've pivoted to working more on building the fish movement and influencing institutions such as seafood certification schemes. We hope that these activities actually have a similar level of impact as our initial plans. So how can you help? We would love to hear from you with high leverage opportunities such as public consultation periods of certification schemes. Also, please circulate our job ad and consider volunteering or being an intern. And we'd love to help anyone by connecting them with our network of people who work on fish all over the world. Thank you for listening and thank you for being part of a movement to expand our moral circle. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello, I'm Sid and I'm one of the co-founders for Generation Pledge. Generation Pledge exists because we have a problem. Actually, we have myriad problems, and they're compounded by the fact that we don't have enough resources to solve them. Even if we were to only solve the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations, we still have an estimated funding gap of $2.5 trillion annually, 
and this doesn't even include some really crucial cause areas like catastrophic risk prevention or animal welfare. Fortunately though, there is an opportunity. There are over 275,000 individuals who have over $30 million in assets. These are considered ultra high net wealth. Collectively, they own over $33 trillion. Unfortunately though, this money isn't being used to create these transformations we'd like to see. So in 2018, out of all this pool of money, only $153 billion were being donated. That's less than 0.5%. And when we look at how it's being deployed, it's being deployed in ways that we wouldn't consider the most effective. So most people will say that they are donating to education, which a lot of that money is going to alma maters from the people who own this money. Um, then a lot of money is also being um, deployed in things that they'll call healthcare when it's actually looking at first world, first world healthcare or specific research that isn't as impactful as it could be or global or long-termist as it could be. And the, the, the problem is that this is simply not good enough because this is such a tremendous opportunity that we're not capitalizing on. And this is what we decided to try to shift. See, my co-founder and I have a unique access to this world because we ourselves are inheritors. So our parents have a lot of wealth that either they generated or they themselves inherited. And as inheritors, we had a unique opportunity to work in the space in the intersection between effective impact and ultra high net wealth families. And while working there, we noticed this unique opportunity that there wasn't yet an organization bringing inheritors together to talk about how we can use our unique opportunity and all the assets that we're set to inherit for effective impact and to create that educational process. And that's why we decided to create Generation Pledge. So Generation Pledge is in many ways Founders Pledge for inheritors in that we make two commitments. The first is a commitment to donate at least 10% of everything we inherit within the first five years of inheriting. The second is a commitment to use effective impact as a lens through which we see all our resources, our assets, such as our investments, business, or philanthropic assets, but also our personal resources, so what we're doing with our time, our energy, or with our influence, our contacts. We're just getting started. We had the idea two years ago and have been working tirelessly since. And right now, in June 2020, we're launching our very first cohort of pledgers. Nonetheless, we already have around 40 people committed to the pledge, and we think seeing publicly available numbers, we estimate that this represents around $750 million in pledge dollars. And we are in 11 countries. We're just getting started, and we're very excited about the possibilities with Generation Pledge, and we could use help in growing. There are three things that you could help us with if that is of interest. The first is that we're looking to meet more inheritors. So if you are one or no one, please let us know. The second is that we still have a funding gap to cover for 2020 and 2021. So if you know someone interested in funding in, effect, in EA um, Meta Impact, please let us know as well. The third is that we're hiring. We're looking for a community director to help us lead in, cr in crafting the community feel as we go through the first cohort and beyond. And so we're looking for someone with very strong social and emotional skills and who's very comfortable in ultra high net wealth settings. Thank you for being at EA Global and thank you for watching this. Bye. Let's say you believe the well-being and flourishing of people could exist in the future matters just as much as that of people alive today. And let's also say you're lucky enough to have a billion dollars just burning a hole in your pocket. What are you going to do with it? Maybe you try to reduce the chance of existential catastrophe. Some of the wipes humanity out or permanently destroys our potential. But is it possible that existential risk, X risk, is low enough already or so hard to reduce that you should instead find some other way to improve the world? And even if you do focus on X risks, which risks? Nuclear war, bio risk, AI risk? And which particular interventions? Remember, you've only got a billion dollars. You can't do it all. These sorts of prioritization questions are core to EA and are just as relevant if you happen to not find yourself with a billion dollars to blow. For example, if you're deciding on a career path or on where to donate a few hundred or a few thousand dollars a year. There will be a lot of factors that go into answering these questions, including personal fit and moral beliefs. But one really pivotal set of factors is how likely various existential catastrophes are and how much various actions could change those likelihoods. 
Unfortunately, those are really, really hard things to estimate. In fact, it's even hard to know how much you should update your beliefs based on the estimates experts have come up with. Here are some reasons why. First, the evidence will be most directly relevant to making those estimates are things like previous times humanity went extinct or permanently collapsed. This evidence is fairly hard to come by in advance for obvious reasons. Second, many of the experts' estimates that have been made so far were basically just quick guesses. Third, we're mostly getting estimates from people who are more concerned about x risks than the average person is, so it's possible our sample of estimates might be biased upwards. Fourth, many of the estimates probably aren't very independent from each other, as many of the estimators have likely worked together or read each other's work. Fifth, the work of Philip Tetlock and others suggests that in many domains, forecasts for events even just a few years away are often pretty unreliable. Sixth, it's often hard to interpret precisely what is being estimated. For example, is it just extinction risk or existential risk more broadly? So given that litany of challenges, what should we actually do? Well, one option would be to just totally give up on having beliefs about which risks are more likely than others, which interventions are likely to reduce risk by more, etc. This is a really, really terrible option. Those likelihoods clearly make a difference to which risks and interventions we should focus on. So this option will make it impossible to do good prioritization. A second option would be to entirely ignore experts' beliefs and be guided only by our own beliefs. This is just a terrible option, rather than a really, really terrible one, so we're at least heading in the right direction. One problem with this option is that ignoring experts doesn't tend to be a great move in general. Another problem is that most of the challenges with X-risk estimates noted above also apply to one's own beliefs. A third option would be to just to avoid explicit quantitative estimates and yet still form more qualitative beliefs and still pay attention to qualitative statements. This means statements like there is only a remote possibility of extinction due to nuclear war this century, or X-risk from AI is more likely than X-risk from gamma-ray bursts. This option isn't terrible, but it's still not the best we can do. One reason is that these qualitative judgments about X risk still suffer from many of the challenges noted above. Another reason is that using qualitative beliefs or statements can lead to major issues when trying to make decisions, or when two people are trying to work out precisely what they each mean and whether they agree or not. For example, precisely how low a chance is a remote possibility? Is it a 1 in a billion chance we can safely ignore, or a 1 in 100 chance that might still warrant a lot of attention, given the stakes? And how much higher is X risk from AI than X risk from gamma ray bursts? 2 times higher? 10 times higher? A million times higher? So what do I actually suggest we do? What mystical, wonderful fourth option have I saved till now? Well, hypothetical EAGX virtual attendee, I'm very glad you asked. The starting point is to have people come up with explicit quantitative X-risk estimates and have other people pay attention to these estimates and update their beliefs based on them. That's roughly what much of EA has been doing so far, which is a good thing. For example, in 2008, some researchers gave estimates of the chance of various human extinction events by 2100, such as from nuclear war or natural pandemics. And these estimates have been referenced often in EA. But what if this particular set of estimates isn't very reliable, or doesn't reflect the more typical or recent views of experts? After all, this was just an informal survey of around 15 participants from 12 years ago, and it faces many of the challenges noted above. And what if as a community we're anchoring too strongly on these particular estimates, rather than being influenced by a broader set of views or forming our own independent views? And what if we want to know about things that weren't estimated there, such as the chance of permanent dystopia rather than extinction, or how much various actions would reduce the risks? To address these concerns, I built a database for every single estimate I could find of X risk or similar things. And people can add additional estimates that they found or made themselves. I'd really encourage you to check out the database. Go to bit.ly slash x hyphen risk to do so. I'd also encourage you to help build up this resource by adding any relevant estimates you come across. My hope is that this collaboratively built database will allow us to get a much more complete picture of the distributions of views on these matters, both the points of consensus that do exist among experts and the vast uncertainties and disagreements that remain. And I hope this in turn improves the high stakes prioritization decisions we're continually forced to make as people trying to do good better in a world with many problems and limited resources. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica and I currently run Yale Effective Altruism. This summer I'm co-organizing a virtual fellowship with organizers from McGill and Northeastern. And in this talk I want to make a case for more cross-university mentorship and collaboration and I'll use this as a case study. So for those who are unfamiliar, fellowships are something that have been run at a few universities for several years now, and now some city groups. They're both intro and more in-depth fellowships, but mine is intro, so I'll focus on that. And the goal of that is basically to really ramp up EA knowledge for a cohort of people. Many schools have tailored their fellowships differently, but in ours, we select 15 people who are new to EA from a pool of applicants, and then fellows week for around nine, meet for around nine weeks and have discussions each week covering different cause areas, methods of thinking, and careers. 
There's also additional workshops and mentoring opportunities. And basically these fellowships just hope to provide a really high fidelity model of what EA is and onboard new members. So usually these fellowships are bound geographically. However, since we are virtual now, some schools have been moving theirs online and opening them up to other schools. So a huge shout out to Stanford and Oxford who did this first. I think this is awesome because one, it gives students who are in places without fellowships the opportunity to participate. And also it adds a lot of diversity to the cohort, which makes for a much more enriching experience. So Catherine Lowe from CEA gave me the idea of the one I'm currently running it's basically just the Yale Effective Altruism Fellowship move virtually, but co-organized by group organizers from other schools with new university groups. So these organizers would really like to start fellowships at their respective schools, but they either felt that their group wasn't large enough yet to organize one, or they just didn't know enough about organizing a fellowship. And I think this is super common. Thanks to different schools and a huge shout out to Harvard, there's a ton of public resources on how to run fellowships. However, it can still be super intimidating to run one, especially if you're only one or one of a few organizers at your new school group. So working with these organizers, I had two main goals, and that's that they learn how to run a fellowship so that they can do it afterwards, and two, they get students from their schools to participate in the fellowship and then hopefully help them organize one specifically for their school, or at least join their EA group. And additionally, I get extra help when I'm running this fellowship. So Kaleem, Anna, and Thomas, who are my co-organizers, have been a huge help in advertising, interview interviewing, preparing, running um, discussions, and it seems like a huge win-win. Uh, in terms of advertising, we got 79 people who applied, uh, so that's really awesome. Um, and additionally, the overhead to expanding this to different groups is not terribly high, uh, especially if you already have public resources on how you run your fellowship or whatever project you're running. The most complicated things were copying my resources outside of my Google suite, doing some edits and advertising and making a new MailChimp. Other than that, things were the same fellowship procedures I would be doing anyways. So it's low ho overhead to, ha to add other group organizers, which is really great. And the great thing is that this form of collaboration and mentorship is not limited to fellowships or university groups. Uh, this method could be expanded to various different group projects. Uh, more established EA groups just have a wealth of resources to share with new groups. And thanks to initiatives like the EA Hub, these are pretty well documented, which is awesome. However, I still think that the best way to learn how to run something is to actually run it yourself, and that's a lot easier when you're doing it with someone who has done it before. So overall, um, cross-group coordination in this method, one, helps new groups get off the ground, two, is a win-win for established groups since they get both organizational help and get to pass on their knowledge and practices, three, creates more diversity in your groups and projects, and four, gives more access to EA projects and content to new members. We're still at the start of our fellowship program, but so far it's been going well and I have high hopes. So thank you. So this talk is about the real life experience of running media campaigns to try and prevent COVID-19 deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it asks the question, will they actually do any good? So let me first introduce the organisation I run. It's called Development Media International. We're about as data-driven as you get from a media organisation. I mean, everybody knows that radio and television reaches a lot of people, but do they actually change behaviours? Well, there was no proof, not in the entire advertising world or the entire epidemiological world, because no one had done the, the randomised controlled trials, or they hadn't worked. So we did these, and they did work, and they showed a 56% increase in malaria treatment, 9.7% uh, reduction in child deaths, a cost per life saved in the 200 to 800 dollar range and we had a second trial showing a 20 percent increase in contraceptive use so everything was going really well we had the evidence and then which is what we wanted to do we were able to take it to scale and so by january this year we were campaigning in nine countries in sub-saharan africa and then covid hit and we were suddenly plunged into emergency mode we were all working from home some of us actually caught the disease 
But we knew that this was a disease which was heavily dependent on people's behaviours. We knew that in order to run campaigns, you had to have good relationships with governments and good relationships with the media. And we had those in nine countries. And we also knew that the last thing to go down, even in Armageddon, would be the radio stations. At the same time, we were being told by Imperial College London that unless something was done, two and a half million people were going to die in Africa. And so at, a, at an emotional level, it felt like something we just had to do. So we went for it. We, we started producing radio and television spots before we had any money. We paid for it out of reserves. We got on air very quickly in six of our nine countries. And then the money did come in from Givewell, from Skull, from Malago, from The Life You Can Save, from some generous private individuals. And we got about $1.3 million. Now, we need more but it's carried us through to now. And it's been a strange experience. Usually we deal with the health promotion departments of ministries of health. Suddenly we were now dealing with the, uh, the prime minister's office with directors, very firm directors being issued to us. We're used to dealing with malaria campaigns where there's, there's 40 years of scientific evidence on what works and what doesn't. Here we were in completely uncharted territory where no one, not even WHO or the CDC Africa knew some of the answers. It was a completely different way of working. Will it work? This is the big question. It all depends on what happens in Africa. And here the epidemiologists are all over the place. On the one side, you've got Imperial College London, who say there will be two and a half million deaths by the end of the year. There's been a more recent study by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which has figures even in excess of that. And on the other, you have WHO Africa, who think it'll be around 150,000. These are, these are big differences. So we modelled our own cost effectiveness using the imperial figures. So assuming we could increase social distancing by about 10%, we calculated that we'd save about 40,000 lives in our nine countries. And that would, that would work out at about $50 per life saved. Those are incredible numbers. We've never seen those before. But they reflect the vast numbers of lives at risk and the fact that the campaigns really do affect everyone and the disease affects everyone. Um, under the other smaller WHO numbers, our cost effectiveness would be about a twentieth of that, so around $1,000 per life saved, but that still seems pretty good value in my book. However, at the time of writing, the, the pandemic really hasn't taken off at all. There have been 53 deaths in Burkina Faso, but four in Malawi, two in Mozambique, none at all in Uganda. And we don't know why. It could be because the median age is so young, it's around 9.7 years across Sub-Saharan Africa. It could be because older people live in more rural areas and the disease hasn't found them out yet. It could be that the pandemic's been delayed because the continent took very stringent measures far more early in the epidemic than their counterparts in Europe managed. But we really don't know. And so we face the unusual prospect, if this carries on, that we'll save no lives at all. And that would be a very bizarre result for an organisation that prides itself almost entirely on its, on its impact. But of course, we'd infinitely prefer that outcome. Uh, we can then concentrate on the secondary effects of the pandemic. It, it's important to remember that more people died of measles and malaria during the Ebola epidemic than died of Ebola itself. But we shall see. These are interesting times. Hello, everyone. I am Juan Garcia, Research Associate at the Alliance to Feed the Earth in Disasters, also known as OFED. And I'm going to tell you about our project on microbial protein as food during global food catastrophes. Current future food security research concentrates on addressing factors such as population increase, resource scarcity, resource depletion, and climate change. While these topics are important, there's one that is severely neglected, the occurrence of strong food shocks. What I mean by this is that the human civilization's food system is unprepared for catastrophes that would reduce food production by 10% or more. Some estimates predict around 80% chance of a food shock that reduces global food production by about 10%, and up to 10% chance of global of total food production loss, both within this century. The most extreme food shocks that could potentially affect humanity in the near future are some blocking global catastrophes, because they entail almost complete food production loss for humanity by making conventional agriculture unfeasible globally for many years. This could be a product of a supervolcanic eruption, an asteroid or comet impact, or a large-scale nuclear war. These are categorized as Global Catastrophic Risks, or GCRs for short. In this situation, the loss of food production would most likely kill a much greater number of people than the catastrophe event itself. However, instead of giving up in the face of this fact, we at Olfed study potential food solutions that could help in such events, 
which we call alternative foods. These have been proposed as a more cost-effective solution than increasing food stockpiles, given the astronomical cost of storing enough food to feed humanity through a 5-10 to 10 year nuclear winter. These alternative food solutions we study have to fulfill one or both of two conditions. They do not strongly depend on sunlight, and they do not use human edible foods as a feedstock, because we would rather use those directly as human food in such a scenario. The latest alternative food my colleagues and I have studied is microbial protein from hydrogen, scientifically known as single cell protein or SCP for short. This is a very protein rich product with an excellent amino acid profile, similar or better than that of meat, which is obtained from hydrogen oxidizing bacteria in bioreactors. These bacteria take in hydrogen and carbon dioxide, among other things, to produce a high quality food, which can be produced in complete absence of sunlight, simply using electricity, biomass or fuels. This SCP could potentially be used as an ingredient in foods such as bread, pasta, plant-based meat and dairy, and as a protein supplement similar to whey protein shakes. We studied the production process and focused on identifying potential bottlenecks to the large-scale deployment of this technology during a catastrophe. For this, we reviewed two different options, production via water electrolysis and via gasification of coal or biomass, from which the hydrogen can be obtained. To clarify, Gasification refers to converting the feedstock into a gas by heating to very high temperatures without oxygen, so that pyrolysis takes place. We estimated the cost of building the factories and the energy consumption which would be required for feeding everyone on Earth. We found this technology to be slower in terms of the ramp-up speed compared to other potential food solutions, such as seaweed and cellulosic sugar. But the excellent nutritional content of single-cell protein in comparison makes it a very interesting option for fulfilling the protein requirements of humanity during the catastrophe. Specifically, we estimated that redirecting the construction budget of the chemical industry and related sector sectors to production of single-cell protein could fulfill between 3 to 10% of the protein needs of humanity in the first year after the catastrophic event, and much more in subsequent years. We also found that the industry standard production process based on water electrolysis would be severely limited by the availability of noble metals such as platinum and its high electricity use, which makes the gasification option more promising for use during a catastrophe. Experience from the COVID-19 pandemic has made us change some of our assumptions, such as expecting a faster response to a crisis or more funding for interventions. If you are interested in this topic, I suggest staying in touch with us because we are in the process of releasing a scientific paper to publish our findings. If you would like to know more about alternative foods and disaster preparedness, go to olfed.info for lots of resources. We are always looking for volunteers from many different disciplines. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Jack Lewis and I'm the Executive Director at One for the World, a movement of people trying to change charitable giving to end extreme poverty. We ask people to give 1% of their income to give Wells recommended charities for life. And then we make it really easy for them to choose their charities, set up a donation online and give us permission to collect that money each month and move it on to the charities that they have chosen. Right now, we're operating in the US, Canada and Australia, and we're about to add the UK and New Zealand. However, if you don't live in one of those countries and you'd like to get involved, we are interested in other markets. So do please get in touch and we'd love to have a conversation with you. The main way that we sign people up to our pledge is through groups of volunteers that we call chapters. They usually exist in universities or in workplaces, and we give them a suite of resources and training and mentoring to do two things educate people about effective giving and then if people have bought into the idea that data-driven reasoning is a great way to think about giving and that they can have a huge impact with a tiny donation to very cost-effective charities we ask our chapters to pitch them the pledge and send them to their online portal so that people can sign up now you might be thinking that this sounds quite similar to giving what we can so what's the difference well, many of our staff are giving what we can pledges, and it's amazing that people would give 10% of their income to effective charities. However, it is quite a high bar to entry asking people to give away 10% of their income. We think that there are thousands of people out there who would like to be involved in effective giving and could give an amount that would make a big difference. But if we go to them and say, please give 10% of your income straight away, we think that they'll be put off. 
We also think that if we get people involved at an affordable entry point, particularly when they're still quite young, they'll have a long lifetime value and there's every chance that we can educate them to give more over time, give them opportunities to get more involved in the movement. But we are keen not to put them off in our first encounter with them. And we think that a 10% pledge is just going to put off a certain type of person who might be valuable in the long term. So really, we're trying to be the mass entry point into this movement with a very affordable price point that lets anybody contribute. And then as they see the amount of impact they're having over time, we're confident that they will get more involved. A second big difference is that we have developed a piece of donation software with a technology partner that we use to process donations. And this has two big advantages. First of all, we can see for sure what people's donor behavior is. So it's not just a pledge that you take online by ticking a box or saying that you're going to do something. You put your credit card details in and we can see every month, are you increasing your donation? Are you still donating, etc., etc. The other big advantage of this piece of software is it lets people delay the start of their donation by up to four years. And this has made us really adept at recruiting students. So most charities don't try and recruit students as donors because they're terrible donor prospects because they don't have much money. But if you let people delay the start of their donation, we've already signed up thousands of students who said, yes, I will start giving after I graduate. So that donation software has given us a real advantage there. And it also means that we can get people involved while they're still young, which we think will have a big payoff in the future if they're really into effective giving and effective altruism. So how can you get involved? Well, we are desperate to found more chapters. The amount of money that One for the World moves is basically a function of how many chapters we have. A chapter on average raises about $15,000 in annual pledges each year. And we want to be moving millions of dollars. So we need hundreds of chapters. So if you are a student or a young professional and you would like to set up a chapter with a group of fellow volunteers and persuade people that effective giving is a great thing to be part of and give them the opportunity to be part of the pledge, we would love to hear from you. What do you get in return? Well, we give you training and mentoring. Uh, we give you a suite of resources that will help you to persuade people using the messages that we've found to be most effective. And we give you a dedicated chapter manager who will mentor you throughout the year and help you to be as effective as possible. Why is this a good thing for you? Well, it's an amazing opportunity to learn new skills and to demonstrate those skills and behaviours in your career. So whether you're a student or a young professional, employers will definitely be impressed later in life if you can say, well, I raised $100,000 in annual pledges in a year through my volunteering with this charity. And many of our chapter leaders have gone on to do amazing things using the exact skills and behaviours that they developed at One for the World. It's also an amazing chance to have a demonstrable impact because you can see every day how much you're raising and that is deeply personally satisfying so if this is of interest to you we would love to hear from you and if you're interested in taking the pledge that is a great first step and can be done on our website thanks very much hi i'm frankie i work at the forethought foundation as william mccaskill's assistant before that i worked at the future of humanity institute as nick bostrom's assistant and during university i was co-president of the yale effective altruism student group Today, I'm gonna to talk about imposter syndrome and how it's affecting members of the EA community. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which a person doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. It's the experience of believing you're not as competent as others perceive you to be. I've known a lot of people in EA who struggle with this. These are some of the most intelligent and competent people I know. It seems to be particularly prevalent among women and in ethnic minorities. So if we care about diversity in EA, that gives extra reason for us to work on this. Everyone's experience of this is different, but I'll illustrate some of the ways it can express itself by using real examples from my friends and colleagues and my personal experience. If you experience imposter syndrome, you might dismiss yourself as underqualified for roles when choosing which jobs to apply for. When I was a senior in college, I had a lot of anxiety around applying to jobs. I made a spreadsheet, as many EAs start by doing. I browsed ATK's job board and added around 20 roles I thought I might plausibly be a good fit for. Then I watched as each deadline approached and I rationalized one by one all the reasons why I actually wouldn't be a good fit for that role. I didn't have enough experience. I didn't have this particular skill set. 
this was too competitive and I'd just waste their time increasing the pool of applicants. In the end, I only got up the courage to apply to one job, which I felt particularly matched up to my qualifications and experience. One friend who's done research for several core EA organizations told me she's dropped out of late stage applications for imposter reasons. This is somebody who's worked with some really prominent EA researchers. If you have imposter syndrome, you might also imagine that others know more about a topic than you, or that you don't know enough to talk or write about a topic in public. I know some people who are relative experts in their fields, but don't feel like they're qualified to post on the EA forum. Even Will McCaskill, one of the founders of the EA community, said that after his first real post on the EA forum, he had an anxiety dream every evening, imagining people talking and saying, yeah, we lost all the respect for you after you wrote that post. If you experience imposter syndrome, you might discount positive evidence about your skills. One friend of mine described how when someone praises a particular piece of work or a trait she has, or if she does well in a test, she'll find ways to discount that. For example, they're my friend, they have to say that. Or, yeah, but that was an easy test. But when she gets negative feedback, she gives that evidence outsized weight. There are many other ways this might express itself. And I've heard friends who have experienced things like feeling like you must do things on your own and never ask for help, or having an outsized fear of making mistakes or trying new things, or overworking to try and keep up the facade for fear of being found out. All of this can affect our mental health and lead to burnout. And of course, aside from the personal toll this can take, it also really reduces our capacity for impact as a movement. So here are some suggestions for those of you watching this talk. If you identified with some of the examples I gave today, try to notice which patterns you engage in and become more self-aware when this is happening. One of the best ways to take the power away from these thoughts is to talk about them. You could start a conversation in your student group, friendship circle or workplace. Even if you don't think this is an issue you struggle with, probably many of the people around you do and you can help to destigmatize it. Another thing you can do is to give friends and colleagues honest feedback. Give them evidence they can trust your positive feedback because you'll also give them constructive criticism. I'd recommend you all to read Julia Wise's document on countering imposter syndrome and anxiety at work. And if you're a manager, you could also read Julia's Guide to Welcoming Interns. Both of, both of these documents are posted on the EA forum. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about the pitfalls of Bayesian reasoning. So Bayesian reasoning is a way of updating our beliefs in response to new evidence. So for example, suppose we wanted to know whether a coin is biased or not. So we'd probably start with a belief that's called a prior belief. Now this is the belief that we have before obtaining any evidence about the question uh, that we're considering. And in this case, we'd probably think that 50% of the time the coin lands heads. Then what we would do is collect new evidence by tossing the coin a bunch of times and then updating our prior belief each time we toss the coin to form a new belief which is our posterior which incorporates the new evidence. Now this describes in a simple example the idea of Bayesian reasoning which is applicable in many cases in scenarios like this but most applicable I argue when we have well-defined probabilities in a well-characterized situation so that we know how to use the relevant formula in performing the calculations to tell us how to update our beliefs. However, Bayesian reasoning is also widely used, especially in the EA community, to address very difficult and abstract questions. And my argument today is that Bayesian reasoning applied in these contexts suffers from a number of pitfalls that are often overlooked. And so I'm going to discuss these, beginning with the first, which is problems with priors. In particular, when people talk about their prior belief for this or that question, it's often not very clear about what their belief is prior to. That is, what evidence has been incorporated into that belief and what hasn't been. This can lead to evidence being double counted if, when forming our prior, we've implicitly incorporated beliefs about how the world is, which we didn't realize that we had, and then we maybe condition on them again later, which is basically double counting the same evidence. And also, I think that this can lead to uh, conversations becoming distracted by detailed analysis of which is the best prior to use, rather than actually focusing on the object level discussion uh, of the issue in question. As a potential example for this, uh, of this work, that uh, listeners can have a look at in their own time, have a look at the article on the EA forum, Are We Living in the Most Influential Time in History by Will McCaskill. 
if you have a look at the comments under that by McCaskill and Toby Ord, uh, you can see that they go back and forth about the best prior to use. I think in the comments there they mention the word prior about 50 times and spend almost the entire time in the comments talking about the prior to use and almost no time talking about the actual evidence we have uh, for the thesis in question. And I think that it's a bit strange that in this and other such discussions we spend so much time focusing on what belief we should have if we didn't have any evidence rather than focusing on the evidence that we do have and how to incorporate that into our decision making. A second prior that I think uh, can occur with Bayesian reasoning is the difficulty in interpreting and analyzing Bayesian estimates. So it's quite common in EA discourse to present estimates of a posterior probability uh, directly for a specific question. As an example of this, consider Toby Ord's estimates of different existential risks in his recent book, The Precipice. Now, the purpose of such estimates is generally to represent one's overall degree of belief, uh, given all of the evidence for a particular question. But the problem with such evidence is that they can't really be subject to any objective analysis or examination because they're produced by an entirely subjective introspective process of just sort of thinking about it and producing the estimate. We don't understand this process really at all, and I think we should be quite skeptical about the meaningfulness of such estimates, especially for very difficult and non-structured questions. And because such estimates don't have any clear explanation or working parts or detail that you can look into, uh, I don't think they have very much value in informing future work or helping future researchers to make progress about that question. And I think therefore we, could be, we should be quite skeptical of their utility. The third problem that I wish to discuss is the false sense of precision that Bayesian estimates can sometimes give rise to. When we place numbers on our uncertainty, it provides a sense of structure and precision that may not necessarily be warranted. In particular, if we consider very unlikely events, we generally are not very good at distinguishing small probabilities, such as between a 1 in a 1,000 or a 1 in a 10,000 event. However, when we place numbers um, of such magnitudes on probabilities, then we may unnecessarily or inappropriately anchor on such probabilities by ourselves or by others, and thereby giving us more precision and a, sense of, a greater sense of certainty than we have a real right to, given the lack of knowledge we actually have of the situation. So given these various pitfalls, I suggest that for many questions and uh, co uh, controversies that face EAs, I think that we should avoid these kinds of Bayesian reasonings, or at least augment them with other forms of reasoning. In particular, the one I want to advocate for here is what I call explicit model building. And this is not really anything new. It's basically the idea that we specify our assumptions that we have about how a system works or the, what's relevant to a given question, and then we use these assumptions in the context of mathematical models or graphical models or computer models or whatever else and show how they lead to particular predictions or particular estimates. This is a widely used approach from macroeconomic models through to climate models. And the problem with these is that they don't produce all things considered estimates that Bayesian uh, estimates can do. But in my view, this is perhaps too much to ask for in many cases. And often it may be better to avoid the problems with priors and with uninterpretable results by instead explicitly modeling our knowledge of the system. China is currently home to approximately 20% of the world's population. It's also home to approximately 7% of the world's water and 7% of the world's land. If those statistics don't quite seem to add up when you want to feed such a large population, neither does this one. China consumes 28% of the world's meat, and that's only currently. And it's very much set to grow as China's middle class expands and wants to have a diet that is more rich in animal protein and specifically meat. There are really clear environmental issues associated with that, but I think from an EA perspective, there are also other issues associated we should consider, um, most pertinently animal welfare and the billions of animals whose lives and quality of, of life um, hangs in the balance. When we think of Chinese innovation, we often think of Huawei or mobile technologies, um, but Chinese innovation also extends to industrial animal farming. An example of that is uh, pig hotels, which uh, so-called pig hotels, which are multi-story buildings where pigs are born um, and grow their entire lives before slaughter, never setting hoof on land, which is clearly something that is um, incredibly cruel. Last year, in the middle of the year, China's pig population sat at 440 million pigs. Um, and uh, while there are issues like African swine fever, it's clear that there are billions of animals whose lives we need to consider when we think of meat consumption in China. But when we think of innovation, we can also frame it in a positive aspect. And my own research, where I was studying at Peking University, University and uh, recently completed my master's was looking at Chinese attitudes towards cultured meat, which I think is a viable alternative considering um, the growing demand for meat in China and into the future, which will be very hard to supply. Um, and there's a few reasons why I think that there's it's a great time for China to adopt this kind of technology and develop it. Um, China is currently in a transition period. It's moving from largely smallholder farmers supplying national um, 
meat supply. Um, and it's also moving from away from things like wet markets towards the cold chain. Um, and that's only been accelerated by recent um, pandemic of COVID. Uh, when something is happening in China in any industry or, or more broadly in relation to development, if the government is supportive of that, um, it can mean that things move a lot faster than they do elsewhere. So um, in regards to things like regulation or an incumbent meat lobby, both of those things in China, there is less of a hurdle, especially if the government is supportive. But what other benefits are there outside of um, clearly animal welfare? I think there are also clearly public health benefits by avoiding industrial animal farming. And a recent study done in China found that if um, there was a conversion to cultured meat, this would only require 1.1% of the land currently used for meat production and reduce greenhouse gases by 85%. From my perspective, the most important thing to consider in this equation is the consumer. We might have the most advanced technology which can save the world um, and indeed deal with many um, domestic, environmental and welfare and public health issues in China. But if people will not buy cultured meat, um, then, then it, it may not succeed. So my own research first um, involved doing interviews with 18 stakeholders in the current meat industry and in alternative protein and food technology and understanding what are Chinese attitudes towards meat culturally, historically, and also attitudes towards things like vegetarianism. After this, I did a thousand person survey that was funded by the Cellular Agriculture Society. And that survey sought to understand what is the best way to present cultured meat to a Chinese consumer. It looked at things like framing, which was based off previous work done by Chris Bryant and Courtney Dillard, and also based on things like how do we tailor a product that's attractive to a Chinese consumer. Um, and I think that a couple of, of, of takeaways from that is that the Chinese consumer is really attracted by cultured meat because of the food safety and nutritional benefits that are implied by it. Um, and that's because historically in China there are huge issues to do with food safety and not only in relation to things like um, the milk scandal that happened with melanin, but also in regards to things like zombie meat, which is meat that has been frozen for something like over 20 years and then sold back to the consumer without their knowledge. Um, Aside from this, in terms of the product that's actually being presented, Chinese consumers are quite open to a processed meat product, which already is very much part of the Chinese diet when it comes to regular meat consumption. And there's less consumption of products like steaks and cuts of meat that are really hard to emulate when it comes to the technology behind cultured meat. Um, I think for those reasons, um, cultured meat in China is, is something that should definitely be supported, especially from an EA perspective, um, when, when you think of how tractable it is and how neglected it is and um, the, the impact involved. Um, but I think that it's important to consider in this debate that we avoid food neocolonialism and debates that have happened previously in relation to other food technologies like GMO, which is very much seen in some parts of the world as a Western imposed technology um, on, on countries where lives are, are given less importance and where it's new technology can be developed without considering what impact it might have on public health. And I think that in China, this is really important too. When it comes to general discussion around things like greenhouse gases, there is a debate around um, wh whether lower and middle income countries should be able to develop in the same manner that we have done in the West. Um, and it's important to recognize that culture of meat can be beneficial globally and should be indeed adopted globally. Um, and I, I, I think that, yeah, this is a, an issue that is really important for people who are involved in EA and or should be considered to be so and uh, would encourage anyone interested to uh, get involved in the space.